Welcome back to DVR Club Plus, the AV Club's TV recap slash video podcast. I'm your host, television editor Eric Adams, and joining me for a very special episode of DVR Club Plus from You're the Worst, Desmond Borges. Desmond, welcome and thank right. you. How's it going? Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is great. Uh, a, a Chicago native. That's right. Here in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, talking about the show that you make in LA. That's all about LA. Well, it's, some, sometimes we're, uh, we're, we're, we're lucky enough not to shoot in the cold. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, most of the time, I'm assuming, in yeah. Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every once in a while it rains and people go crazy because uh, they, they don't know what it's like to drive. They don't know how to drive when there's water outside in any shape or form. But most of the time, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. Which is funny that uh, you should mention the rain and driving because that's actually a joke uh, from the episode that it we're is. discussing. Uh, it there is. is not currently a problem. Episode 7 right. of Season 2 of You're the Worst. Uh, a, uh, a bottle episode, which is always... I know from a, a TV geek uh, perspective, always interesting to see uh, when you find out that the episode is only going to take place on one set, how do you feel about it? I like it. I like bottle episodes. I feel like uh, some of my favorite episodes are bottle episodes, like that community bottle episode oh, yeah. was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and then what, 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 which one? What, uh, I feel like Friends probably had 12 bottle episodes. But uh, the one where no one is ready is the, the Friends one. The one where no one is ready, right. That's the one where Joey starts doing uh, lunges in all of Chandler's clothes while he's going commando. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love bottle episodes. I think they're great. Does it, uh, does it seem like it's different to you? Because as the actor, you're always going to the same sound stages. So. Well, no, we shoot on location. Oh! We don't have any sound stages. I so did not know that. that. That house that Jimmy, Gretchen, and I live in now, that's an actual house in Silver Lake. So um, it, it doesn't ever really feel stale. And we block shoot, you know, because we shoot four episodes at one time. So we'll do everything from episode one to four in like six days in, in Jimmy's house. And then we'll go to the Froyo place and then we'll go, you know, wherever we go. So there were scenes from other episodes that were being filmed during the bottle episode time in oh, the house. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do like, you know, because this is what, episode seven? Mm -hmm. So we'll do like episode seven, scene two and three then go to lunch, and then we'll do, I don't know, episode f five and six, scenes one and nine. You know, all mm -hmm. in the same day. Ah, the marathon is oh. today. Oh my God, they still do that. Well, I guess we're just gonna have to be stuck here all day. No, we can't be. <laughs> we're adults. We can walk. <laughs> 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 this is a, I, I love this episode because it's got, you know, w within a bottle episode context, you kind of have to find different ways to keep the energy up, even uh -huh. though uh, the scene isn't really changing all that much. So there's, there's dancing, there's, dancing. Uh, there's some great rhythm with the, the callbacks and the repetition. Yep. There's a little bit of improv work. Yeah. Uh, what, what is your personal experience with improv? Because this is becoming a huge thing for Edgar this season. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I was... Um... I, I love improv. My whole uh, uh, acting training happened at the theater school at DePaul University here in Chicago, and our whole first year in acting is all based on improv. We actually don't even didn't even get into text until the second year. So they, they, they wanted to teach you the foundations of how to approach a scene without words, just knowing where you are, who you are, what you want, and how you're going to get it. Um, through physical action and through you, you know what you can make up. Because so, there's often those times, on set or on stage when, you know, happy accidents happen and some other lines are brought in or a light cue doesn't happen and some of the most magical moments happen that way. So I, I love it. I feel like I'm getting to go back to kind of, you know, uh, my roots and being a Chicago when the improv scene's been, w is hugely influential, you know, my whole life. I mean, I was watching, you know, sold out runs of TJ and Dave every Wednesday the, all four years while I was in school. So improv, so. improv doesn't get off very easily on the show. Uh, no, it, no. It, uh, it, it, it gets it gets made fun of, which which I'm you know I'm sure is all in, in a lighthearted understanding. It is. Of, it is a place well, of knowledge and love. It is. Well, two of our writers, Allison Bennett and Eva Anderson, both come from UCB, uh -huh. I believe. So they are uh, very well versed in it, and I believe that was kind of you know their uh, their entryway into the satire. I don't know. <laughs> no, the, but it, the loving homage yes, to improv. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we all have had, 
you know, the, 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 the roommate who tells us a story about a scene that we know nothing about and continues to go off on it. I mean, I think I've probably been that roommate at some point, so we, it's good to laugh at ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> when you, theater girl, yes. improv is the lowest form of comedy. That whole school of yours is just a bunch of actors so janky looking, no one will write lines for them, so you have to make them up yourself. Oh, shit. And what I love is that, like, uh, it kind of takes Jimmy over a little bit. Like, he enters into the the whole improv sphere as Edgar's getting into it, very skeptical, and the last episode, like, he has such a delightful time at the show. Oh, In yeah. this episode, Dorothy wins him over with the eulogy for the mouse. Right. Do you want to improvise a eulogy? I'm afraid even though this speech is a little cheesy, I monster continue. Good a day, little guy. Oh, God damn it, she's good. It's pretty amazing. I can't wait for you to see the eulogy. I can't wait to see what happens with the mouse. I know, right? Uh, that's, that's a thread that gets left hanging. That's kind of a... Uh, in DVR Club, we do speculation corner when we talk about what's coming in the uh, the next episodes. Right. Uh, what's going to happen with that mouse? You you can't leave that behind. It's you such know. it's it's such a big deal. I mean, once a mouse is in the house, that's a saying, right? Oh, sure, absolutely. Dot dot dot. dot. <laughs> if it isn't, we just made it up. Once a mouse is in the house, hashtag you're the worst. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the funny thing about the mouse is, uh, early in the episode, I kind of felt like. Maybe the mouse is going to be metaphorical. Maybe, you know, some of the, the choices that Aya makes when uh, the, her depression is starting to manifest, she starts kind of like shredding up the, the leaves on her celery. Sure. And I thought there was going to be a little bit of a switcheroo being set up there. Pardon me, whether she was the mouse. Yes. Right, right. Well, you know, I mean, uh, Stephen and those writers, they're pretty clever. So they, 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 they layer and structure things in pretty heavily. I don't know, maybe we're all the mouse. <laughs> maybe the mouse is just uh, a metaphor for what's gonna happen to all of us at some point. Is, is the mouse in that box? Shh. Rocket ship to heaven. This is, a, this is a crucial episode for this season. This is kind of, this is com uh, comparative to uh, Edgar's big PTSD episode yeah. last season where we finally figured out, you know, where's, uh, where's Gretchen been uh, going? Why has she been doing this? Uh, it's uh, it's some heavy stuff. It is, and I, I don't think um, we've ever seen it on any romantic comedy or anti-romantic comedy, however you want to label what you're the worst is. I don't think uh, anyone's ever tackled depression, clinical depression, like we're about to do. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's very honest. and uh, It is, it is. And it's something that uh, uh, plenty of people deal with. And, you know, like Edgar can be very sympathetic to her because he's dealing with his own sort of thing. Jimmy, Lindsay, Paul, you know, that I mean, n none of them are shit-stained honey nuts. No one's really dealing with that in their lives. So, you know, to have someone as painfully grounded as Gretchen is and the way she she's going through is I mean it's 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 really something and I really love the the last scene in the episode when she she tells Jimmy you know like you can't fix me do right. not try to do that okay so here's an interesting thing that you don't know about me I am clinically depressed <laughs> it's been going on my whole life so I'm actually really good at handling it uh, it strikes me whenever, and I have no idea why, but it's fine. I'm sorry I never told you. It slipped my mind. And who knows? With the right attitude, this could be a really fun adventure for everyone. So the only thing I need from you is to not make a big deal of it, and be okay with how I am, and the fact that you can't fix me. Can't I, though? I feel like depression is very, sometimes a, a very... Uh, there's an easy way to do that comedically, and uh, I, I like that it looks like the, that obviously you guys aren't going to be doing that. Well, no, I mean, because it, it's not really a funny issue, just like PTSD isn't a funny issue. The only reason that any part of PTSD seems comical is because it's through Edgar's weird sort of lens that, that, that he is, that he is as a person, you know? And when it comes to like clinical depression, most of the time, like, what are really your options? Like, you take meds for it, you know, you, you, go, you go to therapy about it, but it's all, it's a very like um, self-inflicting, self-induced sort of process. You know, there's not a lot of outside help. My father passed while I, when I was 15, and uh, a lot of the people while I was in school, you know, would say, oh, I, I'm sorry, I know what you're going through. And I used to get so pissed off 
for probably a million other reasons for what I for, for what was happening. But I used to get so pissed off at them for saying that because unless if they've gone through it, they have no earthly freaking idea what it's like to be 15 years old and to have just lost your dad. And I think Gretchen is kind of going through the same sort of thing. And with Jimmy, you know, he feels like he can kind of conquer all. Mm -hmm. And in this scenario, I don't really know if that if, if that's a possibility. Do you think there's been a, a change in the comedy world that makes it a little easier to tackle these issues uh, in, in a sitcom in the last few years? Uh, yeah, thankfully to Louis. Yeah. You know, um, I, 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 I feel like, I, I feel like sometimes the, the, the more awkward it gets for us on, on screen while we're doing it, the better that it comes off during the episode. When, when I see different takes and I knew how much we were laughing during those takes. I don't know if they necessarily land as much as they do when we're like, oh shit, oh, that's harsh. And then that seems to be like the thing that everyone gravitates towards once the once the episode comes out. And I mean, speaking of harsh, like this episode has one of the harshest moments when Gretchen oh. just goes off on everybody. everybody. Yeah. What was that like uh, oh. on, that, on that day on set? Oh, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. Well, the thing is, is like we're just all standing there and, you know, like we all know kind of what Aya was leading up towards and going through through these episodes where the audience members don't really know because it's being unveiled to them. And you're just trying to be, a, you know, a really good scene partner and give her as much energy as you can and uh, not take away from it, not pull focus. Like, it all needs to be there because what what she's going for and how pointed it needs to be for in order for it to land and still fall into that dark comedy realm, like, it has to be pinpoint and she kills it she kills it every every take there was like chills just running down our arms this place is an emotional black hole and if it wasn't for the runners yes they have a name they're not just the people you giant doofus i would be driving as fast as i could away from you all but i can't because apparently i live here now due to completely beyond my control wiring issues for which there will be a lawsuit oh we talked about a lot of heavy stuff and this is a heavy episode but it's also got like these great little light moments the the hakuna matata callback i just <laughs> just killed me uh you know like obviously jimmy's the kind of person who the lion king would have completely passed by but yeah yeah but the fact and and the, the the fact that he gets like he's like so pissed off that everyone's just like oh yeah yeah this is what hakuna matata means he's like <laughs> <laughs> it's a little slightly more nuanced than that Okay, roughly. You know, I mean, I just yeah, it's a, it's a, some 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 beautiful subtleties. And also something that like he very clearly felt like this was his own. This was something <laughs> yeah, that he, yeah. as an authentic human being, knew what Hakuna Matata meant. Right. When. He he was the only one in the world who you know read read that. There there was never like a a little baby Simba like. Uh, iconically placed into all of our minds being lifted into the air in one of the most popular movies, movies ever made of all of of all time. Right then. Hakuna Matata. Did you just quote the Lion King to me? The Lion what? No, it's a, it's a Swahili phrase. Yeah. And so uh, you're in Chicago because yeah. your film, uh, Open Tables, is yeah. uh, premiering at the Chicago International Film Festival. What can yeah. you tell us about that film? Uh, it's this uh, cool little, I guess it's under the genre of romantic comedy, but it's about uh, these people who fall in and out of love in the trendiest restaurants and bars in Chicago. Um, and it's almost entirely improvised, the entire movie. Uh, TJ and Dave, uh, Joel Murray's in it, uh, a slew of people from um, Second City and IO are, are in it, and um, my good friend Jack C. Newell uh, wrote it, directed, and is also starring in it with us, and uh, it's fun. It's fun. I can't, you know, I can't wait to see it because he had like the structure of where we were, where we were mapping, where we were going, the places we were going to, but we filled in all of the dialogue, and I've never had that opportunity on camera to do that, and I had an absolute blast. So I can't wait to share it with our fellow Chicagoans. <laughs> well, bringing yeah. improv back up brings us full circle. Right. Uh, we call that a callback. Callback. <laughs> Yes, and. Uh, so I think that about wraps it up for DVR yeah. Club Plus. Desmond, thank you so much for doing oh, no, this. Thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, we'll, catch it. It. we'll catch you next time. See you there. All right, bye. Take care.